and tithely as well if you're watching online. We do appreciate your faithfulness in, in giving. So anyhow, Jonah chapter 3 for the past uh, f- fifth weeks on Jonah. My intention was to only go four weeks of Jonah and just the spirit kind of let me write and write and write and here we are in fifth week and it's only jo- Jonah chapter 3. So you're struggling with me, okay? There's Bibles right in your seats. Go ahead and grab it. Bring it up. Just a little review. Here's the deal. In the book of Jonah, here's the map. If you Google, it would look like this. If you Google, it would look like this. There you go. All right, so here's the deal. I'm going to go real fast and you're going to happen. God is calling Jonah right here in Joppa to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. Nineveh, it's occupied by the Assyrians, so he didn't want to go there because they are the enemy. So the enemies doesn't deserve the gospel, right? So he didn't set a go to Nineveh. He got in the boat, paid the fee to head over to Tarsus. Tarsus is Spain. Italy is right over here. So instead of going 550 miles, he decided to go 2,500 miles. But he got to about here in a boat. A storm came around, and people in the boats were grasping for anything. So Jonah decided to say, throw me overboard. That's how you're going to save yourself. So they throw Jonah overboard, and the, the, the fish spit him out three days later back here on land in Joppa. Okay, so that's what happened so far. So if you read through the book of Jonah, you realize the correlation between Jonah and Jesus. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation whispers the name of Jesus as Jonah was called by God. Jesus was called by God. The only difference is Jesus ran into Nineveh in a way, were the sinners. So Jesus ran towards it. Jonah ran away from it. Jonah was swallowed by a fish. Jesus was swallowed by the grave. Jonah was thrown off the boat to save. Jesus resurrected to save. Jonah has to struggle to save Ninevites. Jesus struggled to save all of us. Can I get an amen? Neil, good seeing you, buddy. All right. Can I do that during sermon? Is that that okay? (laughs) All right, so here we go. Jonah chapter 3. Let's bring it up. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah, second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was... A very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Next slide. No next slide, I guess. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, for you, when you read that, it might not mean a whole lot. But for Jonah to go a day's journey into Nineveh, it's a huge, huge deal. For the Jewish people, Frankie Babe, you appreciate this. For the Jewish people, day and night, it's not like the way we view day and night. It's, it's not sunrise to sundown. It's evening to the next evening. That's why sometimes in, a, in the great city of Boca Raton we live in, you hear about Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. Every Jewish holiday began with what? sundown. So the scripture said Nineveh was really big. It took about three days journey and then Jonah took a day's journey. That means Jonah went straight death smack into the middle of the city to preach the gospel. This is no easy task. And in the midst of God's sovereignty, somehow he took a guy Call them to go preach the word to people he doesn't like that he considered to be the enemy. To change his heart completely. To go dead smack into the middle of Nineveh. A priest, a Pentecostal preacher, and, and a rabbi. They're all very good preachers, they're teachers, and and one day, they, they were sitting and having lunch, and someone came up to them and said, you know, you guys, uh, it's easy to preach to people. You guys, if you're good enough, and if God is with you, why don't you try to convert a bear? <laughs> so, like, okay. So they all sat down. They said, we're going to go preach to a bear and to see who wins, right? And we're going to resume back in seven days and tell the stories to see who can actually convert a bear. So Father Flannery, seven days later, came back with a broken arm. 
And the other two asked, so so how did it go? He says, I went to the woods to find me a bear, and when I found him, I I began to read to him from the catechism. Well, that bear wanted nothing to do with me, and I began to slap me around, so I quickly grabbed my holy water, sprinkled on him, holy Mary, mother of God. He became gentle as a lamb. The bishop is coming next week to give him his first communion. So that was from the priest. And then the Pentecostal preacher steps up with a broken leg. And he says, I, I had a better story. I went and I found the bear and, and I start preaching to the bear and, and tell him he's going to hell. And we start to wrestle. We wrestle up the mountain. We wrestle down the mountain. We, I, I, I steer him towards the water and I row into the water and I baptize him. And after I baptize him, he was as gentle as a dove. They all, wow, that's great. So the rabbi was wheeled in on, on his wheelchair and with the IV still connected to him, it just released from the hospital. And I said, what was your story? And the rabbi looked at them both and said, circumcision was not a good thing for the bear. Get it? <laughs> All my Jewish people, I love you. <laughs> there you go. All right. Sometimes we make Spreading Christianity of the gospel as if like we're preaching to bears. That, that we make spreading the gospel like it's impossible, like how hard it's, it, we make it harder than it is. The word of the Lord of jo- came to Jonah the second time, go into the great city. So he took a day's journey, as we all understand the way the Jewish people view day's journey is not the same like we do. When God created the heavens and the earth, he says there was evening and there was morning, and there was evening, and there's morning. So for the Jewish people, a day's journey, it's literally 24 hours. He started in the evening, he walked all night, all day in the sun, and now he's dead smack in the city of Nineveh. Why is that impossible? I mean, why is that important for us to understand? Because Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, For I am not ashamed. Right? For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. The Jews first and also the Gentile. Because Jonah was not ashamed of the message of Christ. Jonah was never scared about preaching about Jesus. He didn't run away from Nineveh because he was afraid to talk about God. He ran away from Nineveh because he didn't want to preach to the enemy. He didn't want to preach to the people he didn't like. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news either. Because it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jews first, and then the Gentiles. Do I need to explain that? Do I need to spiritualize this so you can understand? I don't think so, because I'm going to tell you like how it is. Okay, you ready for this? Hold on to your seats at home. Hold on to your wife, your kids. Stop looking around, okay? Pay attention. I want to tell you like how it is. The gospel needs to be preached and teach, and Christianity in America need not to be ashamed. We need to be unashamed of the message of Jesus Christ. This is how I invite people to church. Jesus wants to see you. I would often tell people, come to church with me. Jesus wants to see you. Not because I say, like, oh, we have awesome worship or, or we have awesome sermons or, you know, I'm, whatever. Jesus wants to see you. Be unashamed that the American church, us sitting in these seats, how can I move us beyond these seats to living a life of unashamed? How can we get together and move beyond these walls to live a life of unashamed? How can can we as Christians in the comfort of the American life be unashamed of the gospel? As, As Paul would say, it is the power of God at work. We need to invest. We need to invest our, our time, 
We need to invest our resources. We need to invest our energy into spreading the gospel. Jonah began with sundown, walked 24 hours to sundown to preach to the Ninevites. We need and we should be bold in preaching the gospel. We need and we should use our talents, our God-giving abilities to share the gospel. There are over 75 million people visit Florida each year. That's a whole lot of people. There are roughly 350,000 people move to Florida each year permanently. That is a whole lot of people. With a population of 2020 census, missing a few, because I know my wife and I didn't fill our census this year. Terrible, Pastor, right? I should. I know we should, but we missed it this year. But missing a couple, there are 102,000 people, 800, 1,200. 100, 2,800 people lives within the city of Boca Raton. That's not counting East Naples. That's west of the turnpike, okay? Anything west of the turnpike, it's East Naples. That doesn't count as Boca Raton. I, I don't know if you guys know that or not. Like the city of incorporated Boca Raton, it's turnpike east. So anything west of the turnpike, I consider that East Naples, okay? It's not part of Boca. All right, you're missing the joke. Forget it. You're sitting at me, he's like, no, you're wrong. No, that's part of Boca. No, it's a joke, okay? East of the turnpike to the, to, <laughs> to the beach, it has 102,800 people. We're considered the 23rd largest city in Florida and 309th largest city in the United States. With the growing population has increased by 21%. That is a lot of people here in Boca Raton. But if we combine the churches, if we combine everybody who attends church, we're barely scratching the surface. Something, it's wrong. Something needs to happen. Us needs to be unashamed. Sunday should be the busiest day of traffic. Amen? If, if we really talk about preaching this, the gospel, if we really talk about going to Nineveh, the Sunday should be the busiest day of traffic. We have 30-something thousand students move to FAU every year from all over the world who don't know Christ. We have a huge migration from Philly and New York. We got Frankie Babe and the Kalanzis and the, and, and, and the Tony the Stick. Well, maybe not the New Yorkers. We keep the New Yorkers up there. We'll just take the Phillies. How's that? <laughs> we got some New Yorker in the house. My point is this. How can we move beyond the seats to preach in the gospel so we can indent the percentage of Christianity a little bit in within the city of Boca Raton. So Jesus got on a donkey and he entered into Jerusalem. He didn't just preach around the walls of Jerusalem. He went dead smack in the middle of Jerusalem to proclaim the good news. His body was dragged between the trial to the flock to the cross, was dragged in every corner of Jerusalem. Everybody knew who Jesus was, and everybody knew his mission, and everybody knew that he was hung on the cross because his message was proclaimed in the middle of the busiest city in the Middle East, the capital, Jerusalem. And Paul says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jews first and also to the Gentiles. So Jonah went into the middle of the city and he started preaching. And then what happened? Something happened. A miracle happened. And hold on to your seats. Look what happened. Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. Your attention up here. The Ninevites believed God. 
a fast proclaim, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal, royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways, their violence. Who knows? God may relent and compassionate, turn his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So here's the scenario. Jonah went into the middle of the city and said, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be wiped out. So the king issued a decree. Everyone repent. What if, what if the gospel moved beyond these seats and beyond these walls, beyond the, hey, good sermon, Pastor New, or, or great worship, today or great prayer video what if the, the gospel moves beyond these seats and it reach and it reach and it reach and maybe the mayor of city of Boca Raton might be a Christian one day maybe or, or maybe the governor of Florida becomes a Christian one day or, or maybe the one who who's in charge of the world could be a Christian one day and talking about Jesus verse 10 it says when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he has threatened. That's for you and I. Forgiveness is real. God loves you. It's real. God accepts you for all of our mistakes, all of our crazy things that we do, all the crazy things that we say, all the times that we turn away from him or deny him completely with our friends, his forgiveness is real. But why do I know that it's real? Because it says something in here that I think you should pay attention to. The way Jonah used the word God for Nineveh, it's a little bit different than my Jewish friends. Raina, thank you, babe would use the word God. So when Jonah used the word God for himself and for his people, he uses this word, Yahweh. So the way they pronounce it is, is yod ha ve ha right? So they didn't have vowels in there. We add that in there to make sense for us. But with the way the Jewish people reads it is, is yod he va he and they have such a, a reverence and worship and respect for God that they spell it out in English, G without the O with the D. And it, it's such a high regards that they don't even say it out. And a lot of times they just kind of breathe. Or, or God's name to the Hebrew people is whisper. It also means the Lord is one, that God is in control. But that's not the same word that he used to tell the Ninevites because the Ninevites wouldn't have known. They don't know who the God of Israel was. So the message has to be brought to them. And when he goes and tells the Ninevites, he says, Elohim, it's going to wipe out your city. Why is that important? Because at some point, we need to understand the word Elohim means the all-powerful one, the creator in control of all, na all, all nature. In our lives, we tend to make ourselves like gods. Like we worship ourselves, we worship our job, we worship everything that we do other than the one true God. So when Jonah came into Nineveh and says, you need to turn away from all the gods you have created because there's only one God, and that God is going to wipe your whole city out, and they repent. So Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, he says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent. For the kingdom of heaven, it's near. Jesus came for the truth, for the Jews, but the message is for all of us. Jesus was the Messiah for the chosen people, but the message is for all of us. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. First for the Jews and for the Gentile. We're the Gentile, except Frankie Babe and Reina. Who else is Jewish? And I said, there you go. You guys are awesome. You're the chosen people. But I love what Paul says. First for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. So the message of Jonah to the Nineveh is the same message that Paul to us is the same message. Jesus in the middle of Jerusalem, it says, repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven, it's near. What about you? What about us? What do we do? Ninevite repented, turned away from God. I mean, turned away from their little gods and worshiped the one true God. It's forgiveness real. Can, can God really take our sinful life and make something out of it? Bart Miller, his life changed at the age of three. Go ahead and come forward, Larry. After his parents got divorced, uh, Bart lived with his dad. His family thought it was best for him. And the way Bart writes in his essay, he says, my dad was never really a dad. I was often used as a punching bag. He had anger issues. He describes it as we're driving down the road, and, and even if someone just cut him off, my dad would use me as a punching bag. I would often miss school or hide at my friend's house because uh, I would get by life in middle school with a guitar and a couple of songs and the church. Bart experienced something a child should never experience. If Bart never gave up praying, inviting his dad to church with him. High school year, Bart's dad became ill and diagnosed with cancer. Bart never left his dad's side and continued to share with him the gospel. And continue to ask him to come to church. And this is what Bart wrote. He said, I got a front row seat to see a guy from being a monster to following desperately in love with Jesus. Freshman year of college come around. Bart's dad passed away. And he wrote, that was the only time I really got mad at God. Not during the abusive years of my childhood, middle school, elementary, middle school, or high school, but when he died. I was mad at God because at the age of 18, freshman year of college, I got to experience the dad that I always wanted. At 40-some years old, he says, I was really upset and had to work through all that. At his father's funeral, Miller's grandmother made an offhand comment. As we often do when people went from from not knowing God to knowing God and, and they passed away, we often say, I can only imagine what your dad is doing right now in heaven. So Bart was so intrigued by the idea that what his grandma said, I can only imagine what your dad is doing, Bart. And eight years later, he wrote the song. I can only imagine when all I'll do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my 
heart feel when I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still when I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Amen. Will I dance for you, Jesus? Man. I can't, I can't, I can't imagine. And the message is for you, for us, for all of us. But beyond these walls, there's, there's, there's 100,000 people. That needs to hear it. How can we move beyond these seats? By being unashamed. We make preaching the gospel as like preaching to bears. It's not. Just tell them Jesus wants to see them. Amen? For the next few moments, if you never have made that decision for Jesus. It's not just for the Nineveh. It's not for the people beyond these walls. It's for us in this room as well. If you never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior, today could be your day. And you've never been baptized, today could be your day. But you know, I, I hear the message. And if you don't have a church home and you would like to make this as your church home, we welcome that as well. To come up here and I'll introduce you to the church. I'm not asking you to sign your firstborn away. That's, that's not, that means of being a member of our church. Just to welcome a hand of fellowship to do the work here in Boca Raton. But most importantly, if you never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, come meet me up here. We'd love to walk you through.